This is the Pixio PX275C Prime, a 1440p 100Hz IPS gaming monitor that is, in the words of Pixio's marketing team, great for Steam Deck users like them and me. The reason for that is thanks to the rear-facing I.O. You get one HDMI 1.4 port, one DisplayPort 1.2 port, but importantly here, one USB-C port, which supports both display in and 65 watt PD charging out. That means that you can plug in your Steam Deck and not only get video out, but it handily charges the deck while you're at it. Also, can I just take a second to talk to all of the other monitor manufacturers? See these really useful labels on the ports here? The, the ones where they list what port version it is and you know what the maximum refresh rate for that port is? Every monitor should have that. Seriously. Let me know in the comments if you would like to see that on more monitors too, because I know I do. So you've got your deck plugged in, it's, it's charging, and you're ready to gate. What's it like? Well, Pixio made it clear that I should give you an honest review of this monitor, so truthfully, it's pretty bad. Um, when I plugged this Steam Deck in via USB-C, it refused to let me game at anything higher than 720p. It does detect that this is a 1440p 100Hz monitor, and in this menu UI, it looks perfectly fine, but the second you launch a game, it's back to 720p. That looks about as good as you think it does as in it looks terrible. Even if you could get the deck to output at 1440p, even on the lowest settings for everything and the least demanding games, the deck really can't game all that well at that high of a resolution, and certainly not 100 FPS. I would imagine you're much better off getting a 1080p display instead, which should work a little better and should look a bit better too. I'd also argue that the monitor could really do with some USB-A ports for things like a mouse and keyboard, as once you've plugged in the only USB-C port into the monitor for video and charging, you're left with no way other than Bluetooth, which is terrible for latency, to connect other devices. Luckily, the monitor has you covered for sound with two 3-watt rearward-facing speakers that are fine. I mean, you do have an earphone jack on the back should you want to use something a bit better. Okay, so it's not quite right for a Steam Deck, but it should at least still be a good gaming monitor for more conventional systems, right? Well, um, sorry Pixio, you asked for this. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, it has a bit of a weird look to it. It doesn't look like a 1440p monitor. It looks like it's trying to render a 1440p frame on a 1080p panel or something like that. I mean, it's not, but that's kind of what it looks like to me. I noticed horizontal lines across the panel, even on Windows desktop. I thought it could be a, just a large gap between the pixel rows, but an up-close photo of the pixel arrangement, and yes, it is an RGB layout, shows no noticeable gap. I'm not sure I can explain that one right now. One thing I can explain is the contrast. Pixio quotes a 1000 to 1 contrast ratio, which is pretty standard for an IPS panel. Sadly, in my testing, it can only manage around 890 to 1, and a hair shy of the 350 nits of peak brightness figure at 324. That's not the worst that I've seen on an IPS panel, but it does mean most of the darker shades end up compressed together and kind of hard to distinguish. Something that is also a little strange is the brightness uniformity. This isn't something that I normally mention, although I do test it on all displays just in case, but this panel is lopsided. The left hand side is up to 60 nits darker than the center. That is a sizable drop. This isn't something that I picked up immediately, but after knowing to look for it, I did spot it while using the monitor. It is pretty normal for the center to be the high spot and the outer edges drop even up to 10%, but almost 20%? That's a bit much. The color gamut coverage is something that Pixio specifies down to two decimal places. We should see 122.76% coverage of the sRGB spectrum and 90.5% of the DCI-P3 color space. In my testing, I got a little less, 82% of the DCI-P3 spectrum. That's still not bad though, and neither is the color accuracy. It averaged a delta E of just 1.77 with a maximum of 4.22. 
The maximum isn't great, although it is a darker grey, so that's kind of to be expected with a lower contrast ratio, but overall that's a pretty good result. Some more good news is the input latency. My open source response time tool reported an average of 5 milliseconds for on display latency, which is spot on considering the 10 millisecond refresh rate window at 100Hz. The time sleuth reported 2 milliseconds, which lines up well with the OSRTT data and is a pretty good result, so no complaints there. Sadly, this is where the positives end, because I've avoided possibly the worst result uh, test results so far. Uh, I, I can't avoid it anymore, I just, I, we gotta get it over with, right? Ready? So you know how this, they claim this is a 4 millisecond great to go response time? Well, hey. Come on, get on with it already. Okay, fine. It averaged 22.6 milliseconds, okay? It's one of the slowest monitors I've tested. Even with the single overdrive mode set to on, the single best transition was 9.4 milliseconds. The slowest was 40. 40 milliseconds! I would highly recommend someone at Pixio order an OSRTD Pro from me so that you can test this yourselves and update your marketing materials. There is no way to even cheat and measure this, this badly that would produce a single 4 millisecond response time result, let alone an average, and a 567% error kind of sounds like false advertising to me. Now, just to show you what that looks like, even at 100 hertz, where new frames are only drawn every 10 milliseconds, unlike at, say 165 hertz, where it's every six milliseconds, you get four to five frames of ghosting visible at any one time. That results in smeared motion. In games, it is pretty noticeable. It, it makes aiming a lot harder. Any fast-paced game is really going to suffer here. Games that don't move so quickly aren't quite as bad, but this sort of performance isn't the sort of thing that I'd want to pay my own money for. I also have some gripes with the physical build and quality. The stand's foot is pretty small, which while great for not taking up too much space on your desk, means that when you try and use any of the adjustment features like tilt, height adjust, or especially swivel, it just spins or moves the foot. The panel is also a little too heavy for the stand, which means that it wobbles. A, a, a lot. <laughs> the uh, little joystick that lets you navigate the on-screen menu is straight out of the injection mode process, complete with burrs and sharp edges. It also seems just a little bit broken when you try to push it right. It does still work, but you have to wrench on it to get it to register. The on-screen menu is incredibly basic. It's the same OEM style menu that you can find on a bunch of budget monitors, and you'll find the FreeSync and Overdrive settings in the MISC menu. Overdrive consists of off, or on, <laughs> that's it. Um, it does improve the panel a, a tiny smidge, but it's clear that there is a lot of room for tuning the, that profile in future firmware versions. Now, if I'm being honest, almost all of this is either addressable with a firmware revision, a much better overdrive mode could easily bring the response times down to a, a more manageable level, or are things that I could put up with for the right price. If this was stupidly cheap, like $120, maybe $150, $180 at a push, I could forgive all of these um, quirks. So, how much does it cost? $280? Oh, fuck! With that said, <laughs> those are my thoughts, but I would love to hear yours in the comments down below. Uh, what do you think of the Pixio PX275C Prime? Is it a monitor you would pick up yourself? Would you pick up something maybe a little bit higher refresh rate in the more sort of standard 144Hz, 165Hz range? Uh, or would you pick something maybe 1080p for your Steam Deck instead? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. Other than that, that's kind of it. I'll leave a link to this in the description if you are interested. Uh, there's also a load of ways that you can both stay up to date on these videos, like hitting the subscribe button, turning on the bell notification icon, or you can support the channel through YouTube, Patreon, uh, pick up a hoodie or t-shirt like this one, or a load of other designs I made myself, 
or uh, if you want to buy your own open source response time tool, that you can do so at osrtt.com. I've also got a latency specific tool on the way, so keep your eye out for that. Drop your email in the uh, like newsletter box and I will let you know when that is available. And otherwise, that's kind of it. Check out the rest of the videos on the end cards. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video.